beginning of the year that we were going to be starting in Matthew and uh, that we would do the Beatitudes to start the year. You'll remember that. Some people remember that. That was good stuff, right? Um, I love the Beatitudes. And then I, I had no idea what we were going to do over the summer, but I knew it was going to be a summer surf thing. And there we went right from the Beatitudes into um, the book of Acts and the first eight chapters of the book of Acts. Do you remember where we ended in the book of Acts? Remember what the last sermon was about? Anybody? My wife couldn't remember either, so you guys, I don't expect you. You're, you're off the hook because Elizabeth. Nobody? Someone died. Does that help you? Stephen, stoned to death, right? And right after that happens in the book of Acts, it says that there was this great persecution that came upon the church. It was like that was this catalyst of, of, of uh, dispersion. And God had told them right from the beginning, right? You have to go to Judea, or Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, right? And what were they doing at that point? Were they doing any of that? They were just kind of huddled in Jerusalem, right? And so Stephen, in a way, was, was God's way of dispersing them. And there's a whole sermon there that I'm not going to go into today. But in the very first words in, in 1 Peter here, it says, this is the letter from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's chosen people, maybe. I'm writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And that's the very first verse there. And it's really interesting because all those people that had then been dispersed went to their hometown and started to spread the gospel there. And that was what God had originally intended, right? So in modern day Turkey, if you know where that is, and modern day Greece, those are kind of the two areas that Peter is writing to here, the, the churches. Um, because after these people were dispersed, they went back to their towns and, and there they were, um, ready to plant a church, um, which is what we should be doing too, right? Ready to go to the next town, ready to go to the next, to the next village, sending out leaders to, to go spread the word somewhere else. So um, there will be more talk about that coming soon uh, for Living Water also. So I don't know why this isn't working today. I think Kayla's doing it. Yeah, that's good. You're good, Kayla. Just leave it right there. Um, so how many of you have ever said something that came out of your mouth and immediately you uh, realized you probably shouldn't have said that? <laughs> Happen to anyone? Here's Cameron, you too? Yeah? You're too young, huh? Um, Here's my most recent one. I went into the kitchen the other day. My wife was standing there doing dishes, I think, putting something away. And I said, man, you got way bigger this time than the first two really qu really fast. And I said, you're way more beautiful than you were the first two times too, right? After I realized, yeah. How do you think that conversation went? So it's like the words come out, and you're like, get back here. Give me those back. <laughs> but Peter was kind of known for that, wasn't he? I'm going through a study right now, John MacArthur on the 12 apostles, and, and it says, he says, Peter is the apostle with the foot-shaped mouth. <laughs> and sometimes I feel like that's me. Like I have a foot-shaped mouth every now and again. Um, and it always seems to be with the people that you love the most, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> it's never the ones... Um, it's never strangers. I'm always nice and polite with strangers, but um, with my wife, I tend to say things that I probably shouldn't, so uh, God forgive me. But <coughs> we've all been there. We all know what that's about, um, but Peter had kind of a special knack for that. Uh, he was, the <coughs> he was a, a boisterous person. He was always the first one to speak up when Jesus asked a question, and a lot of times what came out of his mouth was, was wrong. But a lot of times his boldness paid off, didn't it? I mean, he was the one who got out of the boat when Jesus said, you know, do you want to walk on the water? And uh, he was the one when Jesus said, who do, who do the people say that I am? And then Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter immediately, the bold one, gets him said, you're the Christ. You're the living Messiah. You're the one we've been waiting for. And so Peter's boldness could be a really good thing, and Peter's boldness could be a really bad thing. We see this transformed life uh, from Peter, and we're calling the sermon series Obey, um, just because I think um, 
That's all that Jesus was saying to him uh, continually over and over again. And when we look through this letter that Peter wrote to the churches, we see this word obey and obedience just over and over again. It's like the major theme that's here. And uh, yeah, uh, so it was always more, it was more appropriate than calling it shut up and listen because I think that's what Jesus wanted to say to Peter a lot of times too. Um, but it was just Jesus obey me, Jesus obey me, Jesus o- obey me. He's saying to Peter. So there we are. Verse two, we kind of already went through. Um, I wasn't really planning to do that, but it just worked out so well with communion. And just to just to just chew on that verse just a minute again, we'll just read it one more time, then we'll move through. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him. There it is for today. You have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's awesome. May God give you great, more and more grace and peace. <clears throat> and you can go to the next one there. All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a good way to start a verse, isn't it? All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And though your faith, and through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive the salvation which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. And, and Peter here is talking about kind of different stages of salvation. And there's this initial stage where aren't you glad that just as soon as we're saved, there's this place in heaven that's reserved for us. It's like immediately God has reserved this place for you in heaven. He says that it's pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. And how many of you like me are just longing for that? I just... I, even, even here on this earth, when I look at the relationships that I have, when I have a relationship that is just pure and undefiled, I just gravitate to that. Because it seems like as through the course of ministry and through the course of your everyday lives, I'm sure, it's just everything is so messy. Does it ever feel that way? Just like every conversation, every relationship that we have is just messy. And we had this game night, and, um, and, and God bless these little kids that came in, but man, it was, uh, it was tough with five little kids chasing them around, and it was just like, man, I just want some pure and undefiled children, but that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> but even my friendships, you know, some of those can get really messy, and we have some situations in the church where people are struggling with addiction, and, and there are children that we see that, that, that run around this community and doesn't seem like they have anyone to care for them. And it's really defiled. It's really unpure. How about change and decay? I mean, I'm only, I'm a young guy. I'm only 29 years old. But the, the older my kids get, the more I realize that my body has changed and decayed even in the short time since my high school days. Um, I play with my kids and they are uh, never ever tired it doesn't seem like (laughs) and I'm tired after about five minutes of playing and I have to like will myself for the last two hours but um, I love it I enjoy it but I know that my body's changing and decaying and I know many of you will say Andy you have no idea (laughs) 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 you have no idea what change and decay is yet Um, and I understand that I get that, but I'm already there. But we can look to this future that we have. There's this body that you already have that's in heaven waiting for you that has no change and decay. That when you get there, you can play with your kids forever and never get tired, just like they do. You'll have that energy that you wish for. Um, That's awesome. That's something that's so good to look forward to. Um, But most of all, just that we'll be in like that presence of God that we experience in worship, that's just like scratching the surface of what worship will be like in heaven. 
I mean, just the glory that descends on this place sometimes in worship or on worship nights. And you guys, do you know the feeling that I'm talking about? Where you can just feel the presence of God enter this place and it's like thick, like a fog. And I get sometimes to the point where I can barely breathe and tears well in my eyes because of the presence of the Lord in this place and the glory of the Lord in this place. And that's just like a thousandth of one percent of what heavenly worship will be like. That's amazing. That's amazing to just look look forward to that. Hmm. Go to the next one, Kayla. There we go. So be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. And how many of you with the trials in your life and you just say, Yes. problems come and you're like yeah come on god that's awesome not me not you either but that's what peter's saying isn't he be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead even though you have to endure many trials for a little while because we know we have that heavenly vision and we can look forward to that but there's still work for us to do here isn't there Um, there's still something else for us in this life But when we see these trials, look at what he says. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. So we should be truly glad for the trials because they're testing us. They're purifying us. And that's exactly what we need, isn't it? Um, to be more effective in the kingdom, I was thinking about, you remember the illustration of the silver? Do you guys remember that? And we talked about when, when, you, when they would purify silver, um, this is before modern machinery, they would bring it to a molten point and skim off the, the dross from the top, the slag. And, and when they get that off of there, uh, they would do it again. And it just continually over and over again. And do you remember when the silversmith knows that it's pure? Do you remember that? The silversmith knows that it's pure when he can look down and he can see his reflection in the molten silver. And that's one of my favorite illustrations of all time as far as Jesus working on you and I. He's just continually just pulling the impurities out of us. And how does he know that we're done (laughs) in that one area of life? When he looks in and sees himself. I mean, when he looks in that silver and sees the reflection of Jesus Christ on Andy, on Lori, on Jim, on Bobby, on Paul, whoever, that's when he knows that he's, that he's getting the work done. I was thinking about that. I was thinking about steel. I mean, you know, what's steel start with? Iron, right? And iron, iron coming out of the ground is very much impure. And if you tried to make iron or steel out of impure iron, you would end up with a very poor product, um, something that has no strength to it, something that you could never build a skyscraper out of because um, it just wouldn't hold. So they have to purify that iron first um, before they inject the, the chemicals and the oxygen to make it into um, a hardened steel. So the iron has to be pure in order for us to be strong. And I, I feel like that's another illustration. He's purifying us to strengthen us, He's purifying us um, to make us more like him. And I was thinking about water, too. I mean, we have this, our church is living water, right? And Jesus says, out of you will flow rivers of living water. And that's, what, that's our goal. But I can tell you, at one point in my life, I was like, uh, out of me was flowing rivers of deadly water. Um, I have a, I have a addictive personality, and I have a, uh, oh boy, what would the word be? I'm an influencer. And that used to be a very negative uh, personality trait for me because when there were people that weren't uh, low where I was, that weren't feeling the way that I was feeling, I have this incredible ability to drag people down with me. And uh, that was not good. That was not good. And God forgive me for those days in my life where out of me was flowing deadly water. But I think God, through Jesus Christ, can purify that flow out of us too. 
and I hope that now that I'm a river of living water flowing out into this world, and I know that I'm not perfect, so God is always continuing to purify what's coming out of me. Um, that's a picture of the Holy Spirit, by the way, the living water that comes out of us and does the work in the world. Um, so it's getting rid of the, the flesh in me that's, that's running out and just letting the Spirit be the only thing that comes out of me. So He purifies us to make us stronger. He purifies us to make our life more profitable. I mean, how many know that 99.9% .9 gold is more expensive than 90% gold? Um, he wants it. Yeah, Josh, you know very well, don't you? Uh, he wants us to be more profitable, to be more fruitful in our life, doesn't he? I mean, he wants us to live 100% completely for him. So when we see the trials of life, it should make us happy because he's doing something in us. He's changing us. He's molding us for the work that he has for us to do. And I look back at my life, several examples. I can remember in college, I had like 100 bucks, and I knew that that was the last money that I was going to have until the last semester. And the semester was like two months from ending. It wasn't, I was like, I had nothing. And uh, I went to Sam's Club because I had a Sam's Club membership, and I bought $100 worth of hot dogs and waffles. And that's what I ate for 60 days. Nope, no potatoes, no ketchup. Hot dogs and waffles. And praise the Lord, I still love hot dogs and waffles today. I'm not sure how. But I can look back at that time, and it was a trial. <laughs> I mean, it was, there was nothing. There was no money. I, I had nothing to pay, mu to pay bills. I had nothing to buy food. I had zilch. And... Uh, I can look back on that and say, man, God really did something in me through that. And I don't know how many years of my life have been knocked off from that diet, but, <laughs> but the value that God added through that time was amazing. And, and many of you have been through that, times of poverty, times of struggle, and, and God gets you through. And it creates this trust and, and, and leaning on him. Starting a business. I mean, when I started my business, we, sp we spent basically everything that we had. All of our savings was put into it to get it off of the ground. And I won't get into the whole story, but I got like three paychecks in the first six months. And it was just like, okay. It was all fear. There was no faith in my life when we started the business. <laughs> and I'm not sure how, but I started with just all fear. That whole first week and month and quarter it was just what are we going to do and it was almost like I left God out of the equation until he said hey why don't, you, why don't you bring me into it and lo and behold the more I bring God into it he starts to replace my fear with faith in him and now today I have no concerns about what the business is going to do I, I, I just show up to work and work hard and I know that God's going to bless it but there was a time in my life where it was a real trial I didn't know how I was going to get through that, but God taught me something. He purified something inside me to make it better. Starting this church, how many of your faiths have been tested in the last two years? How many times, Jim, have we talked about, oh, what are we going to do? How is this going to work out? And it's just like God shows up. He just does it. I don't know. I wasn't going to tell this story, but how about this? We're, we're $2,000 short of paying off the building, okay, um, at, the end of, at the end of last month. On Monday morning, I went into my office and there was an envelope on my desk from a man in Newcastle who I had met one time for about five minutes I talked to him. And he, I opened up the letter and it said, my mother just passed away. Um, she left me an inheritance. I heard about what you guys are doing and this is just a blessing for you. And I lifted up the post-it note and it was a check for $2,000. <laughs> I mean, that's just... It's just silly because, you know, I, I sit there and I run the numbers and we don't even have money problems as a church. And I sit there and I run the numbers and I'm like, okay, when are we going to pay this off? Blah, 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 blah. And it doesn't matter. God is there. He is faithful. He is working and active. He's purifying all of us. Amen? Gosh, the sermon's not even started hardly. I was giving this to Elizabeth last night. I was like, there's like seven sermons here. I don't know, I don't know where I'm going here. But I have so many other stories like that, you guys, and most of them are just not church appropriate, so I'm not going to go there. Um, 
but I can tell you I've been places, I've done things that I'm not proud of, but God has used those things to grow me and to change me into the person that I am today. And I know that he's doing the same for many of you. If you don't know him today, he's, he's willing and able to work in your life the same way. It's not because I'm special. Trust me. <laughs> it's not anything that I've done. It's what he's done. Let's look at this, verse 8. You love him even though you have never seen him. And though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. <clears throat> as soon as I read that, I immediately thought of Doubting Thomas. You guys know Doubting Thomas? How many don't know who Doubting Thomas is? You've heard that terminology before, I'm sure. You're such a Doubting Thomas. You ever heard that, Bobby? No? My wife hadn't either. I'm not sure. You've never heard that either? Wow. I guess, they don't, I guess we don't use that terminology anymore. Well, people would say that if you don't believe something in general, that you're just a Doubting Thomas. But this is where that phrase comes from, is John chapter 20. And uh, Jesus had, had risen from the dead. Um, Jesus uh, had visited the apostles, uh, 10 of the apostles, and Thomas, who was one of them, was not there. He was missing, uh, off doing whatever. Um, we don't really know what. But they get back, and the, the apostles say, Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And he says, <coughs> I won't believe it unless I see the, na see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. And Peter was there for this conversation. He was there when Thomas said that. And, uh, and lo and behold, eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them, and he said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. And look at my hands. Put your hand in the wound in my side and don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. It's like he believes at that very moment and he knows that, that Jesus is back, that Jesus has risen from the dead. And Jesus says this, you believe because you have seen me, but blessed are those who believe without seeing me. And uh, that's an amazing statement and I think that stuck with Peter. And I think that comes out in writing this letter when he says, you love him even though you have never seen him. He's, he's referring back to Thomas there. And he's saying, how good is it that you love him even though you have never seen him? Because it's crazy uh, when you kind of think about it. When we, talk about, when we talk to the world and we say, I'm in love with Jesus Christ, they kind of look at us like we have two heads, don't they? Um, Anyone ever have like a celebrity crush in high school that, they're, that they wouldn't mind sharing? Who is it? Farrah Fawcett, okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, all right. You know, mine was, oh, was seventh grade. I'm going to show my age here because you guys are going to be like, wow, you're really young. Britney Spears. <laughs> yeah. 13 years old, I was in love with Britney Spears. And now I can look back on that and be like, ugh. <laughs> what was I thinking? How could I have been in love with someone that I never even saw, that I never even knew? How is that possible? And it's ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, we see these systems of like mail order brides. Like, oh, I'm in love with her. Well, you're in love with her because she's 30 years younger than you, but... Um, that's another point. But there's, how can we love someone even though that we've never seen them before? Because that's what it sounds like to the world. It sounds like me as a seventh grader saying, oh, I love, I love Britney Spears. And now I go out and say, I'm in love with Jesus Christ. And they look at me the same way. Like, oh, you're just, that's foolish. That's foolish. So how can we do that? It sounds kind of ridiculous. How can I be so how could I be so infatuated with Jesus when I've never seen him? Is it crazy? Is it delusional? Is it? Just a little bit of faith there. 
it's not crazy. It's not delusional at all. You know why? Just a couple verses before. Jesus is here. Jesus is working in my life. It's crazy for me to be in love with Britney Spears because she's not involved in my realm of activity whatsoever. But I can go through story after story after story of the ways that Jesus Christ has come into my life and changed me through his Holy Spirit, has brought me out of problem and trouble and trial. Solution that he's brought into my life over and over again. I can place all of those things for you and I can say, Jesus Christ, I'm in love with him because he's here, because he's real, because he's active, and here's how. It's not crazy because he's doing that. He's purifying me and testing me as one would purify gold, just like Peter said. <clears throat> hmm. He's active. Is he working in anyone else's life or is it just me? Okay, so there's a lot of testimonies in here that know that this is true. John chapter 21, I never read this quite like this, but Peter is talking with John. Uh, Peter had been with the disciples and they just had this catch of fish and they're making breakfast on the shore and Peter, or uh, sorry, Jesus goes up to Peter and he says, Simon, that was Peter's original name, Simon Peter, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he's saying, Peter, do you love me more than the other 10 disciples do? The other 10 apostles? Do you love me more than they do? And Peter says, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus says. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he's using this Greek word agape. And it's for unconditional love. Um, it's a love really that only God can give. Uh, it's a love that we can try to aspire to, but we'll never get quite perfect. And so, really, Peter is saying, or Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me completely unconditionally with everything that you have? And Peter, I think, because he's just prone to say things before he's thought about them, says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. And then the last one, um, Jesus changes the word that he uses. And he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And this time he uses a Greek word, phileo. And it's a, it's a term for brotherly love, um, like a, a love that you would have for your best friend. Uh, it's a love that I have for many of you. It's this brotherly, sisterly, sibling love. It's still strong. Uh, it's still really good. And, and Peter, or Jesus is basically asking him, Peter, do you even love me as your brother? Um, and Peter starts to break down. Because I think when I look at this scripture, I never quite read it this way, but I think he just kind of said, yes, Lord, like jumping out. Like, yes, God, I love you with everything that I have. And we know that we're not like that. I know that there's some days when I'm going through some things and, and I don't think about God first. And my love for him fades to the background and the problem rises to the surface and I focus on it for a little while and I'm just, I'm just not perfect yet. And I know that you're not either. I know that you know what I'm talking about. But he finally says, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you even love me like a brother? And Peter was hurt. Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus says, then feed my sheep. Then feed my sheep. There's three, three different questions. Peter, do you love me more than the rest of these do? Do you love me unconditionally? Do you even love me as a brother? And after each time, he says, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. And I think that's a picture of the church today. It's not just a commission to pastors, okay? This is a commission to all of you. Um, Peter was a leader in the church, but feed my lambs is feed the young ones. Not just children being raised up in the Lord, but new believers. Um, because new believers need someone to come alongside them and pray with them and raise them up and, and study with them and all of those different things. So feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Are we taking care of each other in the church? 
when a problem arises. I mean, this is why we don't have dinners just to fill the, fill the calendar. We don't have garage sales just because they're really fun. Um, and sometimes, th sometimes they are. Um, but we do that stuff when there's a problem or a need that arises in the church or the community and we say, hey, we're going to step up and do something, even if it's just little. Um, we're going to step up, we're going to have a garage sale and give the money to that cause or whatever it might, might be. And when one of you is having a problem and you call me crying, asking for prayer, I'm there. I'm praying for you. And I hope you're doing that with each other too. In fact, I know that many of you are um, because I'm sometimes difficult to get a hold of. <laughs> and I'm sorry for that. But Finally, he says, then feed my sheep. Are we giving the word to each other? Are we preaching into each other's lives? Are we holding each other accountable to a higher standard that God calls us to? Are we doing that? Would you be able to get Kim? We're almost ready. So sorry, back to verse 8. You love him even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. So I want to ask you, do you love him? If that's you walking with Jesus on the beach, and he says, Jim, do you love me? Do you love me unconditionally? Do you even love me as a friend? I don't know where you're at in your life or your walk with God, but that's where he wants you to be. He wants you to be obedient in everything, loving him and looking to him first in everything. And I know that you're never going to be perfect, but he honors us even, even when we're not. Even when our heart is right, but our actions aren't quite there. Even when I say things to my wife that I should never be said. Jesus is there even in that. Um, with forgiveness and repentance <laughs> in my life. So do you love him? Do you trust him? Even though you've never seen him. When those problems arise, it's the first question that you ask. Oh God, help me. Is it, oh God, I know you're going to take care of me? Or are you saying, oh God, what am I going to do to get out of this? In a flippant manner. Where are you at? And finally, do you, even though you've never seen him, can you rejoice in him with a glorious, inexpressible joy? How beautiful is that? Glorious, inexpressible joy. And I think primarily we see that through worship, but we should walk with that joy that we carry in worship. That should, that should leave with us when we leave that place. That shouldn't stay inside Living Water Church. But are you quick to fly off the handle? Are you quick to get angry? Or does that joy squelch that flesh <laughs> that wants to rise up? Does that joy take precedence in the, in the things in your life? I know this is kind of a challenging message. So I don't, I really don't want it to end on a downer, but how many of you need, need some work in some of those areas? Yeah? Um, I'd like everyone to, that wants prayer for these things to come up. Go to verse 9 here. Come on up. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. This is an awesome promise. Um, when we look at this, this is pretty incredible. Um, all of these things that we have written here. Oh, wow. I'll just stay up here. <coughs> I was going to say this at the beginning, but I guess I'll just say it now. I really believe that living water is kind of primed to launch into something uh, greater than where we are right now. Um, I think Living Water Church it has laid this incredible groundwork. Um, the Summer of Serve was kind of our, our last big learning experience, I think. And I think that we know how to do a lot of things right now. And I really feel like he's going to use the people of this church to reach your neighbors and to reach the neighborhoods 
and he's going to begin to raise up leaders that will replace even Luke and I. Um, maybe not forever, but just know we are replaceable. Um, there are other people in this church that will preach sermons. There are other people in this church that will even lead worship. Um, there are people that will uh, lead teams to do projects um, that have not done so yet. Um, and I just believe that. I, I just know that God is going to start a church planting movement, that this isn't going to end in Catanning, Pennsylvania. And I don't know exactly where it's going, but I know it's going to be awesome. And it's going to require this right here. Do you love him? Do you trust him? Do you rejoice with glorious, inexpressible joy? And so I'm just going to pray. And as I pray, I'm just going to go and touch all of you. Um, I don't know where my oil went. Is it in the kitchen? Bear with me one moment. Someone may have to help me. Thank you. So, using oil isn't some magical thing, but it is scriptural. And um, when we pray for people, especially something like this, I'd, I'd like to just anoint all of you, um, just as, as God wanted us to. So, Father God, as I go around, I just want to pray for each and every person here, just that you would fill them with love, that you would fill them with inexpressible joy, that you would fill them with just trust, such trust in you, God, that, that nothing would be able to shake it, that as the problems of this life come forward, that as the different things that we experience in our own lives, as they come forward, God, that we would just immediately turn to you first, that you would be our first uh, reaction, that it wouldn't be, Oh God, how am I going to get out of this? But oh God, I know that you're taking care of me. I know that you're right here with me. I know that you're doing uh, the work in my life and that, <coughs> that you are going to continue to take care of me as you have before. <coughs> Father God, I pray that you would give us such a joy, uh, such a peace, <laughs> such love that the entire world, it would be unmistakable that we are your children, that they would ask, what is it that gives you such joy? What is it that gives you such love, such faith? And we would be able to tell the story and say, it's because of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and nothing else. It's nothing that I have done. It's nowhere that I have been. It's nothing that I could possibly uh, experience on my own, but only through Jesus is this possible. I pray that over each and every person here, that you would strengthen our faith, that you would help us to do the work that you've called us to do. And I just pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I wanted to give everyone a, 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 an opportunity today to activate your inexpressible joy. So we're going to play one more song that's really good. And I want you to just take that joy to wherever you go from here. So you're excused back to your seats. I thank you for coming up. Man, what a response.